Okay. Well, that's a nice welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank you for getting up so early in the morning, and I wanted to welcome you. Uh, I think that morning is a good time because I'm going to be talking about two beginnings. I'm going to begin today at the beginning of two lives. William Sidney Porter was born in Greensboro, North Carolina on September 11th, 1862, which means that he's practically the same age as Maeterlinck, whom I talked about earlier this week. But the creative force that became O. Henry was born in Austin, where he lived from 1884 to 1898. Now, Will Porter, the man, moved to New York City in 1901. And New York City is the city that he celebrated in some of his best known stories. As a matter of fact, someone asked me, you know, why are you talking about O'Henry in Austin? And I said, well, you know, this is, this is where it began. Um, he was a New York writer, but he began as an Austin writer. And the New York stories, of course, were published under the name O'Henry, and we know him as O'Henry. But Will Sidney Porter, the man, died in New York City in 1910, and he, his grave, the site of his grave, is in North Carolina. So he's a man who, in a sense, you know, spans the United States, but today's focus is going to be about the beginning. Okay. However, I should also say that, in a sense, there's no end, because Will Sidney Porter may be buried in Asheville, North Carolina, but for some of us, oh, Henry isn't buried, he isn't dead. He's alive on every page in every twinkle, every tear, every twist. Because O. Henry, unlike William Sidney Porter, is immortal. So today, my focus is the, te is the Texas years, especially the Austin years, and the way that those years and the gifts that they gave him were part of his memories and part of his creations. So my outline, and I put this, this, the, out the handout that you have, the only part that matters in a sense for while you're listening is that you should have the outline because you should know I'm going to talk about his life and I'm going to talk about information that you can find and I'm going to be talking about his work. I'm actually going to start today with my personal favorite of the Austin stories and it's a story that's set in a place that you can go see for yourself. And then I'll be giving you some electronic information that you can access, you remote people and any of you people or when you go home from anywhere in the world that uh, information about O. Henry, about his work, and about even artifacts that are found right here in Austin. And then I'm going to give you a list of the main stories that are set in Texas, and I've put references and factual information in a Word document. You don't need to write everything down. And then I'm going to become a storyteller. I'm not O. Henry the storyteller, but I'll tell you his own story, Will Porter's own story about his time in Austin. And the handout has links to maps that you can use for yourself to, if it's not too hot, to wander around Austin and to find the places where he lived and worked and enjoyed his days and nights. And then, go back to the writing. I'm going to tell you about some, you know, I'll share with you some pieces of his early writing, pieces he composed before leaving Austin for good. And then, of course, since here we are at Ocon, I'll say something about what O. Henry meant to Ayn Rand. So I'm going to start with my favorite of the Texas stories. It's not one that was written during the Austin years, but it features the Capitol building right here in Austin, not far from where we are right now. This is a story called Art and the Bronco. It was published in 1903, and it's about a painting. That's where the art comes in. And here's the story. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to summarize it, and then I'll read you pieces of it in his own words. Okay. Lonnie Briscoe, a cowpuncher who was known as the boy artist of the San Saba, has spent a year doing a painting, and he wants to have it installed in the state capitol. That's the plan. Now, several politicians are involved in this enterprise. One senator wants the state to buy the painting, so that he can secure the votes of the San Saba constituents. Another senator went along with the plan in exchange for the promotion of his own pet project, an irrigation bill. So art and the Bronco is mixed up with politics. And there's an additional political angle. Lonnie is the grandson of the heroic Lucien Briscoe, who, quote, carved the state out of the wilderness, unquote. So the Senate has taken into account Lonnie Briscoe's 
family heritage, and the political wheeling and dealing, and is prepared to allocate a large sum of money to purchase the painting. But O. Henry, the writer, has prepared us in comically ornate language for the painting itself and for the possibility that things might not work out exactly according to plan. And here's a quotation from the story. Here, among the limestone rocks, the succulent cactus, and the drought-parched grass of that arid valley had been born the boy artist. The tricksy spirit of creation must have incited him to attempted expression, and then have sat hilarious among the white-hot sands of the valley watching his mischievous work. In other words, he wasn't really suited to be an artist, but the tricksy spirit of creation had inspired him. Don't you love that language? I mean, I'm especially tickled by that tricksy spirit of creation. Perhaps some of you thought that the word tricksy was invented by Gollum in Lord of the Rings, right? Remember, tricksy hobbitses? Yeah, okay, no, it's a real word. And O. Henry found a way, he knew it, he found a way to use it. Okay, back to the story. The painting, one might almost say panorama, was designed to portray a typical Western scene, interest culminating in a central animal figure, that of a stampeding steer, life-sized, wild-eyed, fiery, breaking away in a mad rush from the herd that, close ridden by a typical cowpuncher, occupied a position somewhat in the right background of the picture. So we know there's a steer, we know it's sort of in the middle, we know there's some kind of cowpuncher in it, but I think the language suggests to us that the most vivid thing is that we've, we've got the steer and that the rest of the execution is perhaps somewhat primitive. Now, Lonnie, the artist, suspects that the price he's being offered for his painting is a tribute to his grandfather's heroism and not to his own artistic skills, and he decides to find out. He therefore seeks an assessment from a visiting New York artist who tells him, much as he feared, that the painting is not a competent work of art. In fact, the artist says, grab the money and run, okay? You know, he says, you know, this is like a, a gun, you know, it's like a force, but grab, you know, you're no artist, but take the money. Well, the question is, what's going to happen now? Is Lonnie Briscoe going to try to evade the disappointing news that he is no artist? Or will the New York artist critic, you know, get drunk and perhaps reveal the facts, the evaluation of the painting, and thus expose the political shenanigans? These are, these are things that you might expect to happen, but that's not the way that O. Henry wrote the story. Not today. We have instead in the story a gentle twist, an affirmation of honor. And here's what happens. Lonnie assembles his cowpuncher colleagues as if to celebrate the success of the painting. And there they all are, and he's there astride his horse by the name of Hot Tamales. He and the other cowpunchers approach the Capitol building. Let O. Henry tell it. Up the six broad limestone steps clattered the broncos of the cowpunchers. Into the resounding hallway they pattered, scattering in dismay those passing on foot. Right? Imagine all these horses coming in. Lonnie in the lead, shoved hot tamales direct for the great picture. In spite of the defects of the art, you could almost fancy that you gazed out upon a landscape. You might well flinch a step from the convincing figure of the life-size steer stampeding across the grass. Perhaps it seemed thus to hot tamales. The scene was in his line. Perhaps he only obeyed the will of the rider. His ears pricked up. He snorted. Lonnie leaned forward in the saddle and elevated his elbows, wing-like. Thus signals the cowpuncher to his steed to launch himself full speed ahead. Did Hot Tamales fancy he saw a steer, red and cavorting, that should be headed off and driven back to the herd? There was a fierce clatter of hoofs, a rush, a gathering of steel, flank, of steely flank muscles, a leap to the jerk of the bridle rein, and Hot Tamales, with Lonnie bending low in the saddle to dodge the top of the frame, 
rip through the great canvas like a shell from a mortar, leaving the cloth hanging in ragged shreds about a monstrous hole. It's the end of the quotation. Okay, now, as I often tell my students about many things, uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> okay, you shouldn't try to ride through a painting, but that's what he does. And O. Henry has painted a picture for us. And it is indeed a surprise to see Lonnie Briscoe ride his horse, hot tamales, right through the painting. But that's not the end. Lonnie explains to the senators, and I can't do the accent, but this is what he says, that was a fine speech you made today, mister, but you might as well let up on that appropriation business. I ain't asking the state to give me nothing. I thought I had a picture to sell to it, but it wasn't one. You said a heap of things about Grandfather Briscoe that makes me kind of proud I'm his grandson. Well, the Briscoes ain't taken presents from the state yet. And away he rides. He's too proud to take charity. He made that fact decisively clear. His painting is not for sale on those terms. So I think there's quite a bit to enjoy in the story. We get to see a man living up to his own best self. We get to see that a horse can ride at a painted steer as if it were a real one, so at least looks like a steer to him. But we also know that there's more to art, art than naturalistic reproduction. We get to see that Lonnie is proud of his heroic grandfather and proud of his own independence. His life choice here is a greater tribute, a greater honor than any painting that could hang in a building, or indeed, than the building itself. Well, I like the story, and I recommend to you that you read the whole thing. I only read you excerpts, and I have revealed the ending, but oh, Henry writes well enough that I think you can enjoy it after you know the surprise, so go ahead. And I even suggest that you might enjoy reading it aloud, as I did. Okay. Now I'm going into the research part and the links that I've given you on the handout, which again, you don't need to follow them up now, but you've got them to take with you, because there are many things you can do on your own. You know, I've just got an hour here to talk to you and you've got however many days you have in Austin, but you can keep researching on your own, wherever you are, from the comfort of your computer or other digital device, you can access a wealth of information about O. Henry and about William Sidney Porter, resident of Austin. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the computer is really a kind of magic carpet for us. And I want to invoke here Victor Hugo, a writer Will Sidney Porter admired. And uh, Hugo wrote in the novel Notre Dame de Paris, which is sometimes translated as The Hunchback of Notre Dame, that a cathedral is wonderful, but so is the printing press. Right? Remember? Printed books, Hugo said, can become monuments as meaningful as those in stone as substantial, as lasting, and more capable of reaching out, touching people, and covering the earth. Well, now we have the digital age, and the electronic word is our new cathedral. It can be as meaningful, as substantial, as lasting as the printed word or a cathedral, and more capable of reaching out, touching people, and covering the earth. So it's there. You know, it's, it's there for you, and I think it's a lovely use of the computer that you can use it to follow up on O'Henry. Because you can read much of his work legally in that wonderful website, Project Gutenberg, which if you haven't found, if this leads you to it, you'll see a lot of other wonderful books that you can read. And you can find there not only the collections that were published in or near his lifetime, but three posthumous collections arranged more than a decade later. And I especially want to call your attention to, you'll remember the name, The Rolling Stones, which contains material from the periodical Will Porter published while he was in Austin. And you can read The Rolling Stones on Gutenberg, and that'll give you access to things that you otherwise would have had a lot of trouble tracking down. Also, I suggest you take a look at the collection of Postscripts and O. Henry Encore, which feature material from the months Will Porter, O. Henry, he wasn't yet O'Henry, spent writing for the Houston Post. But that's not all. Other good stuff from your computer, you can find finding aids for collections of manuscripts and other artifacts. For example, the O'Henry collection at the Harry Ransom Humanities Center, not far from here, at the University of Texas, 
but it has an online finding aid. So even if you're at home, you can go look for the online finding aid, and there are digital images of many of the treasures. And as some of you know, that's something that's a project of the Iran Institute right now, is making digital images of some of the treasures in that vault. So yeah, this, this is the coming way, not that it's not good to touch things with your own hands, but seeing it shows it to you. You can find, and also, you know, if it's a digital image, you can't ruin it, and there can't be too many, you know, hands sweating on it, but there it is forever. And so you can find online images of the O. Henry Museum archives, which are associated with the home where he lived with his wife and daughter. So we've got the Humanities Center, we've got the O. Henry home. There's an O. Henry collection in the Portal to Texas History, and the website, which I've linked for you, provides links to the original appearances and publication of many stories. And isn't that exciting? You know, what the stories looked like the first time anybody could set eyes on them. And I tell you, I, I do a fair amount of business with eBay, you know, where you can get copies of original things. But, you know, here you've got the pictures of them without going to eBay. And there isn't, there may be, there may be no such thing as a free lunch, but there is such a thing as a free image. And you can go to these websites and see what these things look like. Okay, and um, some of these documents are actually found in the O. Henry Room at the Austin History Center in the Austin Public Library. You can find online a full inventory of the contents of the O. Henry Resources Collection, which was created by and mostly stocked by Truman O'Quinn, great name, Jenny Lind. Porter, another great name, and Thelma Ethel Hoffer, who was also someone uh, connected with uh, Will Sidney Porter and the family. You might want to take a special interest in the stories that refer or allude to Austin, and I've given you a list of those. For help with the list, I thank Gary Hollick and especially Alyssa Browning McQuistian, who is the culture and arts education specialist, also a docent, at the Br Brush Square Museums. That's the official title of the organization that includes the O. Henry House. And my understanding is that it's closed now, but if you go to the website, you can, you can see what it looks like on the inside, and you can see what the various artifacts mean. Okay, and Alyssa helped me by giving me story, a list of the stories that either are exactly about Austin and name it, or that we can tell that it's really about Austin. And I've listed for you the original years of publication and the volumes where they can be, <coughs> sorry, we can find them. And my own personal favorites are the three originally published in Ainsley's and later collected in Roads of Destiny, Friends in Stone Rosario, A Departmental Case, and the one I've just shared with you, Art in the Bronco. But they're all worth reading. You know, they're all worth reading. So, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a very clever and ingenious writer. I think, um, I think it was Mark Van Doren said that nobody feels clever immediately after reading O. Henry because he's cleverer than anyone else you could read. So these, these stories are lovely to read. And wherever you are, you can find the stories and you can find images related to the man who was Will Porter and the writer who was O. Henry. And if you're here in person and it's not too hot, um, you are not limited to the virtual. You can walk the O. Henry Trail. And on the handout, I've given you some locations and you can find them on the linked maps. And some of those linked maps tell you, turn right, go this far, and so on, and you, you can go where he used to be. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you the story, Will Porter and his time in Austin. Okay, he arrived in Texas in March of 1882 when he was not yet 20. He came for his health, and this theme of fragile health became a kind of undercurrent in his life. In his early years in Texas, he lived with the Hall family in the Dull Hall Ranch near Catella in LaSalle County, south of San Antonio. And the Halls, the Halls, as it was said, they had a large library, and he's said to have made good use of it. In 1884, he moved to Austin. And Richard Hall, who was a member of that family, was the land commissioner. So once he gets here, you can go to the map and you can find all these places, and I'll, I'll name some of them for you, but to me it's very exciting that these things are actually here. I know that some of you have been to New York and you've followed Ayn Rand's trail, you know, the different places where she lived, or have been out to Southern California, and similarly, you, unfortunately you can't see the Chatsworth House anymore, but you can visit other locations associated with her. Well, you can do it for O. Henry, and most of the Austin locations are within a fairly narrow 
compass. So you can see the home of the Harrell family, and the Harrells were formerly of Greensboro. That's how he knew them, and he lived there for three years. He worked for the uh, Morley Brothers Drug Company, the Harrell Cigar Store in the Driscoll Hotel, which you can still find, and we know all kinds of stuff. We know where he attended church. We know where he drank. We know where he sang in the church choir or in Gilbert and Sullivan operettas or in the Hill City Quartet. And you can still raise a glass in the Schultz Beer Garden. So, oh, Henry places. Now, a few places are especially important. One of these is the general land office on the Capitol grounds. On January 12, 1887, you know, he'd been here a few years, he began work as a draftsman. And he apparently, you know, had talent for drawing. And he continued there until January 21, 1891. And a couple of the stories, Bexar's script, 2692, and George's ruling, refer directly to that location and to his employment and the maps and the documents there. So it's, it's still there. And uh, the last time I was there, they had an exhibit um, about his time there, uh, you know, behind glass. You couldn't touch things, but um, right there, you know, in, in, the, in the Capitol building. And then there's, I'm not suggesting you go to church, but there is still the First Southern Presbyterian Church, which is now known as the Central Presbyterian Church. And that was an important place for him. Not so much for the church part, but because he sang in the choir there, and so did Athel Estes, the young woman he was courting. Now, it was kind of nice for them to go to church and to sing there because the rest of their courting was somewhat problematic. Her mother and her stepfather, the Roaches, objected to him as a son-in-law because his brother had died young and his mother had died of tuberculosis and so had Athel's father, so fragile health. Now, Athel herself, they thought, was fragile, but you couldn't stop the couple. Their courtship continued nevertheless, and eventually they eloped, okay? They took a carriage to the Travis County Courthouse to get their marriage license, and then they went to the home of the minister of that church who married them. The site of their first home at 505 East 11th Street, well, the, the home's not there anymore, but the site of it, you can still find that on the map I've linked. You can follow them through other places they lived. Between 1893 and 95, they lived at 308 East 4th Street at the corner of 4th and Trinity in the house that has now been moved to 409 East 5th Street. I don't know the stuff from memory, but you know, I've ri written it down for you. And during this time, Will Porter became not just a husband, but a father. But the shadow of illness was hovering over the lives of the young family. There was a baby boy, and he died soon after birth. And then there was a daughter, and she was born in 1889 and appeared healthy, but later in life it turned out that she also was fragile in health. And meanwhile, Athel, Will's wife, became increasingly weak. So we got health problems. In addition, there was another problem for the young family. I mentioned that Will Porter worked at the land office until January 1891. Why did he leave? He didn't get fired, but what happened is that in 1891, Richard Hall, from the family that he'd lived with when he first came to Texas, um, his term as land commissioner ended, and he ran for governor, and he lost the election. Politics. Okay, then Will Porter resigned from the land office and took another job. He became a teller at the First National Bank of Austin at the corner of Fifth and Congress. This was not a good move. The bank has been reported to be poorly managed, he is reported to have disliked his job. For a more fulfilling occupation, he started a small humorous publication, The Rolling Stone. And the volume, The Rolling Stones, contains some of the sketches he wrote for it. Now, I think the stories are good. The project was not a financial success. It cost money instead of earning money. And money became an issue in a different way. You see, there was a problem in the books not the books he was writing or reading, but the record books he was supposed to be keeping on track over at the First National Bank. And some of you know this story, but every time I, I talk about O. Henry, I have to tell it, because that's how he became O. Henry, is because of what happened to Will Porter. A bank examiner by the name of F.B. Gray arrived to inspect the books he noticed some discrepancies between the amounts reported in 1894 to have been deposited 
and the amounts that actually entered the bank records. For example, a customer bought and paid for a draft from a bank in San Antonio. The San Antonio bank paid the draft and so indicated in its statement. Will Porter certified the statement as correct, yet no money was recorded as entering the Austin bank. Where did it go? Well, according to Gray, there were 50 such examples of money that existed on paper and seemed to have disappeared. Well, Will resigned, resigned from his position, but he didn't admit guilt. He said that he had not stolen the money, he had simply been careless 50 times. Well, by April 1895, with the muddle not yet resolved, he did end one source of anxiety, he closed the Rolling Stone, which had expanded to a bigger office, uh, you know, a big office, uh, bigger office, not who it was, and an office in San Antonio, but which did not flourish. And now he needed not only a new job, but a new outlet for his writing. And he and his wife, Athel, had been dependent for some time on the Roaches, her mother and father-in-law who had opposed the marriage, but who were willing to help them out under the circumstances. But he didn't want to be dependent in that way. He was a man of skills and resources, he wanted to close this chapter and move on, and a grand jury cleared him over the summer, so he thought that it was going to be possible to move on. And as I say when I tell the story, not so fast. The story of Will Porter, bank teller, always feels like a slow motion disaster to me in that we can see it coming and we can't stop it. So what did he do? He's cleared by the grand jury, he needs a new job, he needs an outlet for his writing, he left in the autumn for Houston, and he wrote for the Houston Post under the name The Postman. His writings appeared from October 18, 1895 until June 22, 1896. And this was looking good. It was good to have a job. It was good to exercise his imaginative skills. His wife and daughter initially stayed in Austin with the Roaches and then joined him in Houston and then returned to Austin. As far as we know, Apple's support for her husband, her respect for his honor, and her admiration for his talent never wavered. But the wheels of justice eventually rolled around for William Sidney Porter because F. Gray, the bank examiner, had not given up. In February of 1896, four indictments were listed, and Will Porter returned to Austin to be arrested. Then bail was posted, so back he went to Houston. And then he was told, no, he's got to come back to Austin for trial in July. And now things get dramatic, right? He handed in his last column on June 22nd. He packed his bags. He said goodbye to his Houston friends. Athel and Margaret were already back in Austin waiting for him. He bought a train ticket for the journey to Austin. He got on the train in Houston. The train stopped at Hempstead and he got off the train and walked around. When the train got to Austin, he wasn't on it anymore. He decided to do something else. He'd taken a train, the next train, not to Austin, but to New Orleans. And he lived there for several weeks under a name not his own. And then he was off to Honduras, the only Central American country with no extradition laws. Okay, now why? This does not look good. Obviously, it seemed to him like a good idea at the time, and perhaps he was only thinking of that very time, the short range. He didn't want to stand trial. He didn't want to try to explain again and again what he'd evidently not explained well enough the first time, why the records in his handwriting did not match the facts. He did say that on his honor, he had done no wrong, and he was no thief. But look what he did. On July 6, 1896, when he took what I think we have to think of as the wrong train, whether impulsively or by premeditation, he may not have figured out the precise construction of his story, may not have known what he wanted to do next or for how long, but after July 6th, he was a man on the run. And if there'd ever been a good way to explain what happened back in the bank in Austin, there was never a good way to explain publicly and adequately what happened in that train station. So. During his months, so to speak, on the run, he did contrive a way to receive packages and news from his wife and to write to her. Athel packed him a Christmas present 
purchased with the proceeds of the sale, not of her hair, as in the famous story, Gift of the Magi, but of a fine stitched handkerchief she'd made. And she sold that, sent him a present. But in that package, her mother had slipped a little note telling Will that Athel had had a temperature of 105 degrees Fahrenheit when she packed the package. Her time was running out. She was ill. And his time was running out. He returned to Austin and waited for his trial. He worked on his writing, and he spent time with his daughter and his ailing wife. She died on July 25, 1897, too soon to learn the happy news about the first story of his to be accepted for national publication in December 1897 by McClure's. He'd mailed it out from the Roach and Hoffer store. It was published in September 1898. That was the happy news. But by then, many other things had happened. Nothing remotely similar to happy news. The bank examiner arrived to be the chief witness at the trial. He pointed to the discrepancies between Will Porter's numbers and the documented facts. Will's, Will Porter's defenders in general say that the discrepancies in the accounts are not enough to convict a man unless one can show that we know where the money went or that he had possession of the money. But the contemporary judge and the contemporary jury deemed otherwise. Will Porter never said a word at his trial. We don't have the transcript of that trial. We do have the transcript of the appeal, so we don't know everything that went on, but it was, um, it was a couple of days, and he never spoke. Now, his eventual defenders included a very interesting man, an attorney who was also a judge with that great name of Truman O'Quinn, which I mentioned earlier when I told you about the collections of archival materials. And I'm going to quote now from the bibliographical note for the inventory of the O. Henry Resources Collection at the Austrian History Center. This is about Truman O'Quinn. Truman E. O'Quinn, 1905 to 1990, was a distinguished Austin jurist and a recognized authority on O. Henry who amassed a diverse and extensive collection of O. Henry artifacts, books, printed editions of O. Henry's works, manuscripts, and photographs and related materials by and about the writer. I'm still quoting. A highlight of O'Quinn's fascination with O'Henry is that he conducted personal interviews with every identifiable surviving associate of O'Henry's in Austin, Texas. And then Truman O'Quinn and Jenny Lind Porter, an English professor, collaborated on the 1986 biographical work called Time to Write, How Will Sidney Porter Became O'Henry. And it's worth reading, and you can pick up a copy. I don't think it's in print anymore, but you can get copies of it. Time to write how Will Sidney Porter became O. Henry. Now, Truman O'Quinn points to technical errors in the indictments, one date is incorrectly written, and to Will Porter's general character as it was known to his friends. Truman O'Quinn describes the chaos in the banking procedure and the apparent wish to crack down on banks to make an example. He also wrote the foreword to a small booklet, O. Henry's Own Trial, brief for W.S. Porter in the appeal of his case, filed by his attorneys August 30th, 1898. It's reproduced from the criminal records of the Circuit Court of Appeals at New Orleans. But as we know, the appeal was not successful. Now this guy, this judge, Truman O'Quinn, is also interesting to us for a different reason, because he was the father of Kerry O'Quinn. Okay? who was personally associated with Ayn Rand and the objectivist movement in the 1960s. Kerry O'Quinn ran a romantic film series during the flourishing of the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, and he's known for numerous activities and achievements in directing and publishing, and he's still alive. Until a few years ago, he had a website where one could see information about the film series, about his association with Ayn Rand, and there's, there even used to be a film there of the NBI fashion show which some of you possibly might remember. You know, Frank O'Connor was elegantly dressed in that and uh, used to be up on Kerry's website. Now, if we're going to talk about Kerry O'Quinn, that would take us on a different but also fascinating trail. So he's the son of Truman, who was a, a defender of, of O'Henry. Okay, just a few more stations on the Austin Trail. One of these is the site of the Travis County Jail. It's no longer in the middle of the block, from the southeast corner of Congress Avenue on East 11th Street across from the land office building. The trial was held on the second floor of the federal courthouse at 601 Colorado Street. 
it's still there. And now they, the name of that courthouse is O. Henry Hall. Go figure. The trial began on February 15, 1898. The guilty verdict was pronounced two days later. In April, he was moved from the Travis County Jail to the federal prison. He was sentenced to five years in the Ohio Penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio. And some people think that that's, where the, that's a possibility for where the name came from. You know, the O and the, you know, the, the letters for o, o. Henry and so on, you can, you can get, it, get it out of um, Ohio Penitentiary. He went. He didn't tell his daughter where he was going. The, ro the roaches knew, and they didn't tell her either. He never returned to Austin. During his years in prison, he did have time to write. When asked his profession when he arrived, he said journalist, and then he thought a little more, and he said, he's also a, he, said he was also a registered pharmacist, and that was good because that meant that during the time he was in prison, he got to work as a night pharmacist and as opposed to you know, hard labor, and he, there wasn't necessarily a lot of traffic at night, and he had time to write. And he was a bookkeeper. Not so much in charge of the accounts, but you know, other things. He submitted several of his stories for publication, and he was released early for good behavior. When he was released early, he moved to New York. And from 1901 to 1910, he wrote. He wrote as if he were running out of time, and of course, he was. He wrote a shining stream of stories, generally under deadline. He didn't tell people about his prison experience in Ohio or the details of the end of his time in Austin. He did a biographical interview, and it doesn't mention this, but of course, he always knew that someone could come looking for him and that someone could tell the story. The only person that he made a big point of telling it to was his childhood sweetheart from North Carolina, whom he met up with again, and to whom he proposed marriage, and he told her. Okay, at least that's, that's her story, but uh, I, I think that's probably true, that he wanted her to know. But when he died, his secret was still largely a secret. So that's our background. That's the story of Will Porter, and the good times and the not so good times in Austin. Now for us, he's best, you know, in general, he's best known as O. Henry, and not as the Austin man, even though he was in Austin for a long time, but for the stories of New York, the sparkling wit and ingenuity of his tributes to the city that never sleeps. But I think if we look in the words of Will Porter and the writing that he did, we can see the glow of O. Henry, and we can see the qualities we cherish in O. Henry the clever plot twists, the cheerful benevolence, and the exuberant wordplay. We've already heard all of these in the Art in the Bronco, and I've got a few more favorite examples that I'm going to share with you, and they're all from the Texas years, published in the Houston Daily Post during his time in Houston after being accused of embezzlement, but before the actual conviction. Okay. When he wrote as the postman for the Houston Post. He was, in fact, the storyteller from Austin. Okay. And a couple of these I shared when I didn't know Henry Course a few years ago. So um, you, some of you may remember the twists from, from there, but for the rest of you, they'll be new. And there's always something to enjoy in O. Henry, even if you already know what the twist is. So here's my first example. It's called The Confession of a Murderer. He is dead, and I killed him. I gaze upon him lying cold and still, with the crimson blood welling up from his wound, and I laugh with joy. On my hand his lifeblood leaped, and I hold it proudly aloft, bearing its accusing stain. And in my heart there is no pity, no remorse, no softness. For months he escaped me. He scarcely dared to cross my path openly, but with insidious cunning had ever sought to strike me a blow in the dark. I did not fear him, but I knew his power, and I dared not give him his opportunity. He even attempted to torture me by seeking to harm her whom I love. When she would tell me of his approaches, I would grind my teeth and clench my hands in fury and long for the time when I could reach, so I wreak a just vengeance upon him. The time has come. I found him worn and helpless from cold and hunger, but there was no pity in my heart. I struck him down and reveled with heartfelt joy when I saw him sink down, 
bathed in blood and die by my hands. He is dead and I am satisfied. I think he is the largest and fattest mosquito I ever saw. The end. Okay. So, all right, good. Some of you <laughs> never heard it before. Um, and I think if you think back and think about your experience as you heard or read the story, you will remember that the speaker said he had blood on his hand and that he'd committed the murder, you know, by hand. Did you wonder maybe about his gleeful attitude? Perhaps at some point you began to wonder what the story was actually about. Maybe you checked a few premises. The most important, of course, is the premise that the murderer's victim was human, that the narrator had killed a human being. And incidentally, the word murderer, you know, it's from the root for the etymologically for death. And so even though ordinarily we don't think about someone who kills a non-human as a murderer, it's by the standpoint, from the standpoint of words, it's okay. But once you know who the victim is, you can revisit the story from the standpoint of the central fact. And some phrases now have a different meaning. The culprit's attack on the murderer's beloved, the pursuit in the dark. So that's the confession of the murderer and the mosquito. You will find this early sketch in the collection Postscripts, which, as I said, was uh, you know, published posthumously, but you can find it on Gutenberg. And it's a little more than one joke, but I think it shows us the beginnings of O. Henry at work. He's clever, with the cleverness shown in constructing a legitimate surprise, not one that comes from nowhere. It's rooted in the available information hiding in plain sight. O. Henry's known for his surprise ending, this delivers, but you enjoy waiting for it. Cleverness rewards the active mind. Cleverness tells us pay attention and see if you can follow where I lead. You may be a few steps behind, but in the end, I will allow you to catch up. And this is the sort of thing that Ayn Rand paid tribute to in her essay, What is Romanticism? She cites him as a cardinal, oh Henry, as a cardinal example of romanticism, of the glorification of human life. This is Ayn Rand. Philosophically, romanticism is a crusade to glorify man's existence. Psychologically, it is experienced simply as the desire to make life interesting. This desire is the root and motor of romantic imagination. Its greatest example in popular literature is O. Henry, whose unique characteristic is the pyrotechnical virtuosity of an inexhaustible imagination projecting the gaiety of a benevolent, almost childlike sense of life. Okay, that's her recommendation, and I, of course, agree with it. And I think that in this little thing about uh, the murder of a mosquito, we do see life made interesting, a cheerfully interesting event. And now here's another one, also short, also from the Houston Post, showing how the imaginative Will Porter can make something out of almost nothing. Two Houston men were going home one rainy night last week, and as they stumbled and plowed through the mud across one of the principal streets, one of them said, this is hell, isn't it? Worse, said the other, even hell is paved with good intentions. Okay, and the title is even worse. Okay, yeah, that's interesting, right? I mean, in real life, it might not have been so interesting, but it's probably didn't even happen, but O. Henry made it interesting. Okay, now I've got another early piece, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I'll read selectively. It's called The Colonel's Romance. Quoting now, They were sitting around a stove, and the tobacco was passed around. They began to grow introspective. The talk turned upon their old homes and the changes that the cycling years bring about. They had lived in Houston for many years, but only one was a native Texan. The colonel hailed from Alabama. The judge was born in the swamps of Mississippi. The grocer first saw the light in a frozen town of Maine, and the major proudly claimed Tennessee as his birthplace. Okay, I'm gonna stop quoting now and just comment. What are we expecting so far? We've got five men, four of them from other states, looking back. Now, Will Porter himself was one of those Texans who came from somewhere else. The focus, in fact, is on those who come from elsewhere. We're not even told the profession of the native Texan. So what are we expecting? You know, nostalgia, regret, the unrecoverable and irreplaceable past. Well, that would be the cliche. And the next paragraphs seem to be moving in that direction. 
Had any fellows been back home since you left there? Asked the colonel. Notice he refers to their places of origin as home. This promotes the thought that Houston is not home, that perhaps the sense of personal home is rooted exclusively in the past. The judge has been back twice in 20 years, the major once, the grocer never. So now we're waiting to hear about the colonel. It's a curious feeling, said the colonel, to go back to the old house where you were raised after an absence of 15 years. He said he's done just that, and that he, quote, went down to the little grave, sorry, little grove where he used to walk with the girl he loved best in the world, and he says, everything was the same. Above were the same great sycamores and poplars. There ran the same brook. My feet trod the same path they'd so often walked with her. I went to the end of the path. There stood the old hollow tree in which we used to place notes to each other. What sweet words that old tree could tell if it had known. I fancied that during the rubs and knocks I'd received from the world, my heart had grown calloused, but that was not the, say, the case. And then he looks into the hollow of the tree and he sees a note and he pulls it out. Dearest Richard, you know I will marry you if you want me to. Come around early tonight and I will give you my answer in a better way, your own Nellie. Well, we see that his Nellie had agreed to marry him and yet he never got the note. Ah, you know, he confirms what we're concluding. He saw that note 15 years after it had been posted. I'd written her a note asking her to marry me and telling her to leave her answer in the old tree. I never got it, and all those years have rolled away since. Well, we're told that the men he's telling the story to start weeping. The judge sniffed a little. The major wiped his eyes. They, too, had known love. And then, said the grocer, you left right away for Texas and never saw her again. No, said the colonel. Why well, I didn't come round that night, she sent her father after me, and we were married two months later. She and the five kids are up at the house now. Pass the tobacco, please. Okay, so it's got the twist, but you see, it's a very sweet story because we find out what story we're really hearing. We thought that this was sad and wistful about the loss of a chance for happiness, the destruction wrought by an untimely accident. Oh, you know, that um, you know, terrible things happen. We, and we thought we knew the point of the story, right? Isn't that the way of it? We don't get what we want or deserve in life. Chances against us, losing the love of, his life, to learn after the end, years later, too late, that he lost the woman he wanted, the woman he loved, just because she never read his message. You know, the irony, oh, the irony, the missed opportunity, the regret, to which O. Henry says, no, not on my watch, not in my story. And he cheerfully confounds our dismal expectations. We learn that in spite of the accident and without any invitation, the woman made her grab for happiness, and she and the colonel won each other and have been living happily ever after, ever since. Well, I love this. You know, I think it's, it's deep. You know, it's a very powerful no in the face of disaster. It's optimism, you know, that uh, we're not doomed. We're living in the right place. That's the word optimism comes from Leibniz, you know, the best of all possible best of all possible worlds. We are living in the best of all possible worlds where people do not have to be victims of an arbitrary fate. Well, this of course is just the sort of thing that Ayn Rand loved. Right? She called it the benevolent universe. And she talks about, she uses that word, she, I quote it, you know, the gaiety of a benevolent, almost childlike sense of life. It's the hallmark of her own, real, her own worldview, that we can live a happy life on earth. The colonel lives there in that benevolent universe with his Nellie and the five kids. And when we read the story, we do as well. Now, there's a lot more to say about O. Henry, and for today, I just wanted to say something about Ayn Rand. Uh, for one thing, that was one of the reasons she thought that the United States was a place where she would want to live. She didn't learn about it until, you know, fairly late in her education, but she read the stories of O. Henry, and she says, you know, that was something that meant a new life. And, as you probably know, when she came to the United States, the first stories she wrote that we have do show the influence of O. Henry, more so than any other single works that she wrote in her lifetime. I especially recommend The Night King and Escort, which you'll see in the early Ayn Rand, and I think that if you look, you'll see there the O. Henry in the early Ayn Rand. He represented the joyous American spirit, or what she called the spirit of youth, especially the cardinal element of youth, the expectation of finding something wonderful around all of life's corners. And that, of course, 
reminds you, I think, of a clear echo in one of her later works, the description of Cheryl Brooks, the shop girl. No, no, Henry wrote about New York shop girls. And she's described by Ayn Rand as having a common little face, except for a look of alertness, of eager interest, a look that expected the world to contain an exciting secret behind every corner. Okay, so it's almost like a nod to O. Henry. Finding something wonderful around the corner, that was the joyous American spirit she discerned in the writing of O. Henry. In her 70s, she stated that he was one of the writers she read for pleasure. She owned 11 of the 12 volumes of the authorized edition published by Doubleday in 1927. Now, we don't know if she bought those books in 1927, but she did have them with her at the end of her life in 1982. And as for the end of Will Porter's life, he neglected his health and did not neglect the bottle. I told you in the Metterlink lecture, he was you know, born the same year as O. Henry, but he lived all the way to 1949, time enough to read The Fountainhead and to love it. For O. Henry, it was a lot shorter. He was admitted nearly penniless to a New York hospital under a name not his own. He was 47, he had diabetes, he had cirrhosis of the liver, and according to the doctor, he had the most dilated heart the doctor had ever seen. When he died, the friends who knew of his death arranged for a funeral service nearby. And the location, you can't make this stuff up, was a small chapel known as the Little Church around the corner. And that was the end of Will Porter, but there wasn't, it wasn't the end of O. Henry. And we're at the end now of my formal talk, so I can take some questions, and then I'll have a few more words for you. But uh, for now, I'm happy to take questions. So thank you. Oh, we have one question online. OK. Hi, Nikos. Hi, Susanna. Hi, everyone. So we have a question from Jonathan. And he asks, is there a way virtual attendees could get a copy of this trail map? Some of us live in Austin and would love the chance to see the trail you have put together for O. Henry. OK, well, I think that on the app, there, the handout that you people received is there, and it has links. So I think if you look at the handout, there should be links within that. And there are several. You know, there's more than one uh, where you can find the places. Okay. okay. Um, we're going to figure it out, and we're going to let our friends know. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, Shoshana, would you make any distinctions between the work of Texas O. Henry versus New York O. Henry, which, of course, is also early the early, younger and earlier writer versus the older writer, whether it's literary quality, sense of life, emotional complexity, or anything else? Okay, well, you know, that's an interesting question because one thing that's true is that the, some of the early stories were written early and then they're republished later, and so unless you really work at it, it's hard to tease. It's also, it's, it's a short life. It's, you know, like... The poet John Keats, he's dead before 30, and so the early Keats, the middle Keats, the late Keats, you know, it's the same guy. It is true that this man went through prison, and some of the stories do reflect something of that, right? Retrieve Reformation is the story of, of, of a criminal who is freed, but he sounds like himself to me early, and uh, of course the New York stories have the New York setting, which you can't confuse. So I, I, I think it's the same man. You know, it's the same creative force. Right, I mean, you. his whole writing career is not much longer than it took Ayn Rand to write that one novel, Atlas Shrugged. And I don't think you could exactly say there's the early Atlas Shrugged and the later Atlas Shrugged and so on. You know, it's the same writer. That, that's what I think. Thank you. The Night King is a uh, clever story that shows a very different side of Ayn Rand, but just a clarification. If anyone looks for it in the original hardcover edition of the early Ayn Rand, they won't find it. It was included in the paperback. The publishers included it as a bonus. So yes. um, I had a friend of mine photocopy it and then stick it in the flyleaf of the, uh, my original yeah. edition. Okay. I'm glad you said that. And of course, I even said that in the, in the handout. It says the early Ayn Rand second edition. Okay, that's where the Night King is. And the truth of the matter, uh, well, I, I think that um, 
it was not as, um, it, it looked almost a little, a little bit imitative of O. Henry, and so uh, Leonard Peikoff initially thought, well, this maybe doesn't reflect well on her, and then he reconsidered. And I think it's a good story. So yeah, that wasn't in the original, but it is as I have in the handout. Okay. Yes, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, you didn't mention, was there any uh, reuniting of O. Henry with his daughter before his death? Okay, um, his, his daughter Margaret. Um, well, you can look up Margaret and find out her story. I mean, he did invest in her education. He did care for her. It was not really possible to, for him to have the kind of direct... New York wasn't really a good place for her to live with him, especially the way that he was living. And so he cared for her. We have letters. You can even find some of them online. And she, she died relatively young as well. She had fragile health as well. She died young. Margaret did. But... Um, that's your story. Okay, now I've been given the five-minute warning, and I've got um, one thing I want to read to you. So I think if, if your question's short, maybe I can answer it, and then I've got one more thing to tell you. I think so. I'd like to, your, you to comment on how O. Henry is regarded in uh, education over, over the years. Okay. Um, well, I, I think it's interesting. Um, o. Henry used to be taught quite a bit in the schools, and oh, less, to, in my opinion, less so over time. And one way I know this is that I teach O. Henry in my intro to short fiction class, which I'm teaching right now back home. And I always ask the students at the beginning, have you read any of the things we're doing? And they tend not to have read O. Henry. Um, but I think one reason for that might be the setting and or might be that, in fact, you need to pay attention to read O. Henry. And he doesn't, well, you need to pay attention. Um, and it can be more difficult for some people who are not trained to read carefully to pay attention. On the other hand, uh, he was well respected in Russia. There was uh, quite, quite a bit of critical attention toward him when he got translated. And I, th I think that you can still find O. Henry in the bookstores in Russia in a way that you can't always in the United States. So I guess that's what I'd say. And now I've got just a few more words and they come to you from a ghost. Okay, I'm going to let Athel Porter have the last word by way of Upton Sinclair. He wrote a play, Bill Porter, A Dream of O. Henry in Prison, and it was originally published in 1925, and this is a dream sequence. Will Porter imagines seeing his wife as a ghost as he's about to enter prison, and of course she was gone by then. And Athel says to him in this play, you will come out and start over and be yourself. She tells him he has precious gifts, merry words, a shining flood. She reminds him that he once spoke of writing not for the few, but for everyone, for the four million. And she says, write about them, Will, write for them. I see them, eager, hungry, eager faces, shining with gratitude, with hope, with fun, all of them ready to cheer you. Go forth, Will Porter. Do your work and take your place as their storyteller, the voice of the four million. She's telling him, in effect, that he's the storyteller. That's the kind of teller he is, not the blundering bank teller. And that if he began as Austin's storyteller, he can be the storyteller for everyone, for the four million, with the shining flood of his merry words. And so he was, and so he is. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.